wonder. I look at Earth and I look at the things we've done to destroy this fragile little spaceship that we live on going through going through the space. And we've destroyed, you know, we talk about burning, we talk badly about all the burning of the rainforests in Brazil. And yet most of the oxygen is produced by plankton in our use of nickel cadmium batteries and lead batteries and putting them out into the environment has killed a good part of the plankton. Cetaceans are beaching themselves to make so that there's enough food left for the others. So, Pete, we are very, very happy to be able to connect with you and you have been very generous with your time, with your energy, and I hope I have a little more energy left because um, I'm coming after Bill and after David and, and I just have a few wrap-up questions that I want to run by you and uh, we'll see how this goes. So, uh, one of the leading things you said that was that you were involved with robots. That's correct. And I'm just wondering if we could kind of drill down there a little bit and talk about what your background was and how much in, how involved you really were with, with robots. Well, having been involved with trying to build uh, flying saucers, you usually found the flying saucers, if you look at most of the movies, there always seems to be a robot involved with it. And uh, so I was very interested in robots, and uh, in the early days when I uh, built a satellite tracking station before there were satellites, and then tracked the Russian Sputnik when it was launched, and called the government and told them the launch trajectory and the orbital and the frequency it was transmitting on, during the McCarthy era, they uh, thought maybe I was a communist pinko, and so they came and found out that I built it, actually had a satellite tracking station before there were satellites. I was about uh, 17 years old at the time. So that got a lot of notoriety here in Idaho. And at that point in time in Idaho, on the eastern side of the state, there was a place that was called the Atomic Energy Commission, a nu nuclear reactor test site. And it's where the first nuclear power generation was done. And uh, anyway, they anticipated having some... Uh, nuclear problems there and decided they need some robotic type thing that could waltz into a nuclear meltdown and pull the reactor apart so that they wouldn't uh, have a China syndrome taking place. So uh, anyhow, uh, eventually I and a few of my friends got the contract to do uh, robots that could do that. And I naturally had great faith in myself and said, oh sure, and I found out a lot of things that was a tremendous education. I found out that materials that were electrical conductors uh, inside of a heavy nuclear flux became insulators and insulators became conductors and uh, really? very yeah. stiff metals became like toast and very brittle and broke apart or like ashes. And materials like ashes became very hard. And the grease became like welds and so eventually we built a, uh, a couple of different types of, uh, I, I, I won't call them robots because they were truly manipulators. They were devices that at one end looked exactly like we think of a robot looking. It had a pair of uh, arms that would move and grip. And uh, Actually we designed them so if you could grip a, a beaker of liquid you could move it very rapidly and it would tilt it accordingly and not spill it and uh, you could reach around behind you or in front of you or out to the side and then on the bottom of it we had some that had three rolling wheels and some had little tank treads uh, and uh, so this was in the 1955, 6, 7, 8 region of time. At the, that point did they have AI? No, there's no, no they didn't even have, the term hadn't even been invented yet and so anyway, on the other end of this device that looked at one end like a robot was a thing that a person got into. They had a couple of little small one-inch television tubes with lenses on and they put those on they could see stereoscopically. And then they had a couple of little hands that they could move their arms and hands like it and the robot would move accordingly. Or the manipulator would move accordingly. And there could be a distance, right? There could be, be any in. distance up to 20 or 30 miles. But it required wires at the time. Later we made some that were 
uh, worked on uh, radio waves, uh, but for working with atomic materials, radio waves uh, could be interfered with, a number of things, they couldn't withstand that type of uh, lack of uh, physical security, so all of them that we did for them had wires. So let's fast forward to a lot more recently, or at least well, what, maybe not even recently. I don't know when it is you got really involved in AI and you started well, to I got, real Well, first I got involved in, in uh, computers and uh, in 1975, 76, uh, we built a computer that uh, uh, was used in Tokyo at the airport to announce the plane flights in a number of different languages. It was the first use I know of a microprocessor chip in a real product. And then uh, later we built a computer training device to teach people how to use microprocessors and how to use uh, uh, software to accomplish various tasks. And we built that at a little computer company whose name was Cyberdyne. And uh, one of the people who worked <laughs> for us later uh, worked on uh, Terminator, whatever it was. Well, that that was my next question. <laughs> so, so I, I'm not sure how you want to answer this, but the movie Terminator is not so far off base. Am I right? No, it's not so far off base at all. Once we once we got that uh, those working, uh, and it's interesting to note that the computer chip we used in the 1970s. Uh, there are more of those produced uh, monthly than all the Intel chips produced in a year, even today, because it's a chip that was actually designed like a computer, whereas the Intel chips are not designed like computers. And uh, the I Intel is paying a lot of royalties to various people who uh, worked in and on various chips that uh, uh, evolved over the proper uh, evolution of computer chips, what I consider to be proper. We now have a chip that's uh, very, very tiny and uh, has uh, a number of computers built into it that automatically look at the task and adapt themselves. So you may have 10, 20, 30 computer chips working on 30 processes all at once. Uh, in the body of one robot? In the, well, in the body of one little chip. tiny tenth of an inch square chip. That's operating a robot. That's operating a, a robot. But uh, once we got, if we figured out the right language to use and the right computer design to use, I then got involved with uh, a number of people uh, working on building an artificial intelligence chip uh, that... Uh, We'll call it, it was basically the call on it was a fuzzy logic chip. It turns out the only logic that's not fuzzy is fuzzy logic. And it's a chip that can look at a number of different inputs and from those make a, uh, a decision that's correct. So you can, uh, you can be with a robot, you can be looking at bumps on the floor, you can be looking at a doorway as compared to a wall. Uh, you can look at somebody standing between you and the door. Uh, you can look at the width of the door and the height of the door and decide whether it can go through it or not. Uh, it can go over there, manipulate around the person, go through it, not trip over the cat on the floor, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, all using fuzzy logic. And then we, uh, because a chip uh, was doing digital computing, a fuzzy logic chip, either does digitally, if it's high speed enough, it does analog computing. It looks at things as we see them in the real world. Uh, the floor can be looked at digitally like it had millions and millions of little tiny bumps or larger bumps or it can be looked at analog wise because it can sense the roll of the floor and move the wheels and so forth so it doesn't tip over. But weren't the Japanese really advanced in the terms of in, in terms of robotics? Well, I can tell you that when I uh, went to the Idaho National Engineering Labs, which is what the Atomic Energy Commission became, which was one of the nation's largest research centers, 
uh, it's in eastern Idaho. Uh, I think there are 2,200 PhDs that work there. Uh, the whole town is built around, in fact, several towns are built around that center, and much goes on there. Uh, when we went there visiting with supercapacitors that I brought out of the Ukraine, uh, I got talking to some people who found out I was the one who built the manipulators, and they said they had a large contingency of Japanese robotics experts. This was in about 1980. 788 somewhere in there uh, they had a large Japanese conference over trying to sell them uh, manipulators and, and robots and when they saw my robots they said my god we don't have anything like this where in the world did these come from they said hell we've had it for 50 years <laughs> so turns out it was only about 43 years at that time but so basically uh, you were working in, in black projects weren't you well, one could say that. And I, I just have a, a curious question, and, and I, we haven't gone over this ahead of time, so I don't know if you can even talk to this, but it's, it's not diabolical or anything, but I'm curious because I used to love robots and sort of went on the net and sort of studied and was interested in how far they progressed with all of that. And one of the biggest problems they used to have was whether when they wanted them to walk upright like humans, that they would fall over. And how did you solve that? Well, we did it much the same way that Dean Kamen uh, built his, uh, his uh, two-wheeled scooter. Are you familiar with that? Oh, yeah. Um, the, what do they call that? Segway. The, the thing? Segway. The Segway. Okay. Well, okay and uh, uh, it's very simple to do. Uh, Which is? Well, you, you in, simply in, you, you, say you have a sensor that senses whether you're upright or not. And if you're not upright, then you use fuzzy logic to put it back right. Presumably, that's the kind of stuff they put in the F-117 that would have fallen out of the sky. If yes, it, it would. That kind of, right. For example, uh, the programming language that we use is called FORTH, F-O-R-T-H. It should have been called F-O-U-R-T-H because it was the fourth major programming language, but in those days computers wouldn't take five characters. Hmm. <laughs> or six characters, so they had F-O-R-T-H. Okay, so this kind of segues into mind control because I also know that you worked with SRI and you worked with Hal Pudoff, right? And I understand you probably knew, you know, Ingo Swan and a lot of the people involved in, in remote viewing. So uh, what I was wondering, I think you were involved in MK Ultra, and you can probably talk about well, that because it's you been can declassified. Think of, you can think about right? that all you want to think about it, then who knows whether it's true. I. I don't know whether that's true. All right. Well, I know that I worked in a lot of very interesting areas. But you know that MK Ultra is declassified. I don't know anything about MK Ultra. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I've heard about it and heard about it and heard about it. I don't know anything about it. I know some things that came out of it, and I know that I researched some of those things and I built things that I thought were better and turned them over to the government. But other than that, I don't. I I really don't know that. I actually don't know that much about it. Okay. And. Uh, is it true that you're still on call for the government? Well, I'm doing things all the time that uh, I get calls on okay. for a number of different governments, actually. I'm actually a member of the Astronautics Association for Mankind, which is the Russian equivalent to NASA. I'm on the board of directors. So why aren't you on the board of directors for NASA if you're on the Russian Well, board mainly directors? because I have no, I, no desire to be with a bunch of clowns. Okay. If I want to be with clowns, I'd join a circus. So you're really aware of the secret space program, in essence, and you know that NASA is something of a front for uh, almost uh, no, a distraction? I haven't been associated with them for years, so I have no idea what they're doing. Okay, but you, you said NASA's a bunch of clowns. Why are you saying that? Well, because all I have to do is look at the products they have. And, and why are they still, um, I mean, I know they're going to retire the space shuttle any day, but it's basically, you know, a tin can going up in space. Why are they even dealing with that kind of technology at this point, do you know? Because they have it and it works. They have had, they've had about maybe, it depends on how you, how you look at reality. They have what I consider to be about 10% of the budget that they, they really ought to have for the if you look at the things that came out of the space program through NASA, 
probably 50 to 60 percent of the technology we use today throughout all industries came out of NASA. The metallurgy technology and alloys, the temperature uh, resistant plastics and metals, uh, integrated, large scale integrated circuits, uh, you know, basically even the whole transistor technology. I worked in I worked in things like that. My cousin and I did uh, quite a number of spy satellites. Uh, we did the sampling arm that went on the Viking lander to Mars, uh, which, by the way, was run by a fourth powered, a fourth uh, programmed computer. Uh, and uh, so I, I worked in and around that area. I worked with uh, North American Rockwell, uh, JPL, JPL. Uh, a number of different places and uh, got to see the things that came out of there. I got to see brand new things that were 20 years ahead of anybody on earth uh, actually applied and things that were made from them and they were sent into space uh, and they recorded things from space. Uh, the camera that you're shooting me on, the, the image sensor in there was made for Basically, it was made for use in outer space, and uh, that's where they that's where they came from. And so, uh, uh, if you look at return on investment, uh, there isn't a corporation ever in the history of mankind that returned so much on the investment, even ten percent, that the return on investment that came out of NASA. It literally transformed our lives into a whole new century. Take that, which is the only success story that I think man really has, and totally malfunded it. Now, part of the reason was is that they wouldn't pay the appropriate amount of money to get the brain power that they needed. People early on worked for NASA not because they got paid good money, but because they got to accomplish their dream. When finally Congress snuffled their dream, they quit working for NASA. So now you had clowns working for NASA. It should have been a circus. Okay. Not that there weren't great people there and not that there aren't great people there, but they're totally frustrated, I'm sure. Right. But there's also a lot of black projects going on under, under I don't know level. that they're going on at NASA. Really? They, they may be. I don't know. Uh-huh. And what about... What about your familiarity with things like superluminal travel? Um, my familiarity? Hmm. Uh, there, well, no, I don't know anything well, we about have superluminal travel. We have travel. testimony from Henry Deacon and from Jake Simpson, a couple of uh, what we call whistleblowers, which in essence is what you are at this point in your career, mm, in a way. Well, in a way. Okay, you're treading a fine line. <laughs> I'm treading um, a fine line. Uh, and they are, they are testifying that we have superluminal travel, that we have craft that goes outside the solar system. Can you say anything about that? I know nothing about it. Okay. You, you told us, or at least you talked to me at one point, about being um, a spy master. Is that really true? I don't know a thing about that. Okay. Okay. Well, we're kind of striking out here. Um, where do you think well, that we can go with I've all of this? I've told you the things that I'm willing to talk about. <laughs> now you're trying to get me to talk about them. And, all right. Uh, uh, what, what do you know about a UFO detector? Uh, I was asked to build a UFO detector when I was about 14. Uh, and uh, eventually built one. Okay. And, and it's operational? I have no idea when it's operational. Best I know they smashed it immediately. Who's they? The government. Actually, the president ad? of the United States at that time. Really? Okay. Now, um, here's a problem with it. Uh, I'd love to do something with it. It's a very simple, inexpensive technology. Is it based on Wilhelm Reich's technology? No, it has nothing to do with Wilhelm Reich. It's, it's, based, on, it's based on science. And uh, it, uh, the problem with it is that it works in such a manner that it will detect virtually every single type of thing in the universe. So what that means is that it would be the best anti-collision device that ever went on board an airplane.
because it could see every other airplane in the sky. That's What's, the good news. Okay. The bad news is it can see any stealth plane just as easily as it can see a damn dirigible. So that's why they destroyed it? I have no idea why they destroyed it. Well, can we surmise that that's why they destroyed it? I have it? no idea. I don't know that it was destroyed. I'm just telling you that's my feeling. Well, you I've told never, me they took it. I've never seen one. Well, I thought you'd, you would... Yeah, they took it. So what did they do with it? I don't know if they put it in their pocket or put it in the remnants of the Smithsonian. I don't know what happened to it. But I've never seen one out there in operation. I could tell if there were one in operation. How could you tell? Because of how it works. Well, I mean... I'm how? not about to tell the secrets of it. I understand that, but you I can't just, talk about it without you telling the secret. You know if somebody else had your was operating. I'd your know if anybody device. was operating one of them. How would you know that? I would know that because them? of how it works. Okay, would you remote view them, or would you be? No, I, not at all. You have a tracking device on your on your invention. I it, it emits something that is absolutely unique to the device. Oh wow. Okay. There's another kind of detector which was destroyed upon presidential order, I understand. Yes. There Are was you a, able to talk about that? That's uh, probably not. It's probably okay. not healthy for you guys to talk about it. Okay, well, case, I yeah. understand that you, um, and I don't know how, if you can talk about this, but my understanding is that with robots, with any kind of um, device that you're operating using AI or any other kind of, as you say, manipulator, whatever, um, that there's a sort of a, has to be a fail-safe or a command override such that, you call it a gatekeeper, I believe. But no, that's a gatekeeper is a product that allows that to take place. Or not to take place. Or not to take place, and yes, there's a, uh, obviously it's like with atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs, nuclear devices and uh, cruise missiles and whatever. One thing you don't want is your enemy to get a hold of it and use it against you, so there must needs be some methodology to handle that. Are you able to say that you had a hand in, in creating some gatekeepers? Uh, oh, I created gatekeepers, and whether they use it there or not, I don't have any idea. I just know they buy a lot of gatekeepers, or bought a lot of gatekeepers. And uh, I know that right now we're in the process of negotiating a very large order for gatekeepers, uh, what I call gatekeepers, and uh, what they're going to use them for, uh, I really can't mention. Would you call yourself sort of, um, I mean, an inventor? I mean, what? how would you... I have always billed myself as an instrument maker. Okay. I build instruments that see things or hear things or measure things that heretofore nobody else builds. Anybody else builds something, I don't ever replicate it. I don't reinvent anybody's wheels. I invent my own wheels. Okay, I want to I want to kind of go into a different area that we haven't really addressed at the moment, and I want to know if, you know, because obviously I, I realize there's a lot you're not talking about, and there's some stuff that we've got off the record and all of this kind of thing, but do you feel that you're protected? Yes. Do you feel you're protected on an earthly level or on other levels as well? Uh, definitely an earthly level. I have no idea about other levels. However, when you say feel as compared to know. Mm -hmm then I will tell you that I've had a charmed life. Okay. I can remember one time in Vietnam standing in a firefight and remember that basically only machine guns fire tracer bullets and every fifth round in our machine guns at least is a tracer so the machine gunner can aim his weapon because they're jiggling and bouncing so much you can't really use a sight well so you want to see where the bullets are going and place them where you want them. So every fifth bullet goes out and you see a little red glow where the bullet's going. And I was in firefights where the tracers were so thick it was like you're in the middle of a 30-foot campfire that was down to the ashes with a weed eater whipping up, whipping up sparks. And I remember about the third time I looked up and said, you and me, Big Al, all the way. <laughs> because I knew I was being kept alive. There was no reason for me to be alive. Fifty percent of the Marine, o <coughs> excuse me, the Marine officers I went to Vietnam with were killed while they were there. They were there for mm -hmm. 13 months. I was there for I don't know, 23 or 4 months. But uh, 
anyway. Uh, and to this day, you feel that. Well, I've been in other other places that were even scarier than that, and I've done crazy things all my life to, uh, to invent things fast rather than slow, and take it the hard way instead of the easy way, and so forth, and uh, somehow live through all of it. You know, I get the biggest kick today out of some kids spilled a little tiny bottle of uh, uh, mercury uh, in a town nearby and uh, they came and dug an Olympic swimming pool in their front yard and hauled all the dirt off and charged them thousands and thousands of dollars to get rid of the mercury. Hell, I used to spill two or three ounces of mercury a day in my lab, down, which was down a basement, and the only thing it did probably is drop my IQ by 30 or 40 points. but. But that didn't really matter. I used to, I used to, I used to go around to the a piece of lead solder hanging out of my mouth. I must have spent twenty years with a piece of solder sticking out of the corner of my mouth, getting that good lead. And all that did was drop my IQ another ten or twenty points. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm, I've been charmed. Okay, have you been threatened? Oh yeah, I've been threatened a number of times by just about every every kind of person that would want to threaten me. You can make a joke about bastard school as well, that's a good one. Well that was what I was trying to get to, but... Yeah. You, you um, can talk about bastard school, terrorism, that's not that's ter about. AKA terrorism. Can we talk about bastard school at all? Well, uh, yeah. Okay, and, and, and what, was your, what was your experience with that? Well, I call it bastard school. Uh, when I was an uh, officer in the military, uh, very obvious, I was trained in military things. And I was taught to to be the biggest SOB on the block. And I got so good at it, they finally turned around and had me uh, do some other things because it scared them to death. Because I was a mean green killing machine. And uh, so uh, instead of teaching terroristic things, they had me teach anti-terroristic things. And then they, they, in both cases, one, they were afraid that the enemy would learn what I was doing that was nasty. And then they thought I would be, they, the enemy might learn what I was doing to disrupt being nasty. So then they moved me on to other things. You've dealt with mind control in some ways, in some fashions, and, and you know something about the mind, clearly, and about this information field, and I'm wondering if there's something within the information field and or the mind-body interaction that, that can be set up to protect oneself against, let's say, mind control devices such as the, the digital television that is now projecting, uh, you know, able to, to communicate with people in their houses and so on and so forth. Well, that's an assumption that we're making. Right, I, I'm making that assumption, yep. not you. But, and, uh, so I'm, I'm just asking, what is there something, some, some There, there are things that were designed specifically. Uh, as an example, in the probably 80s, uh, the Russians had a thing that was, uh, because it sounded like a woodpecker on a shortwave radio, it was called the woodpecker. Mm -hmm. And they had three large locations that were transmitting probably several million watts per location. And they were phased in a particular area so they could move where the peak of that electromagnetic wave would fall. And uh, it turns out that one of the places here they had it fall was in a town called Eugene, Oregon. And people there were getting sunburns while they slept at night. And uh, they were getting headaches and they were having uh, birth defects and so forth. And the woodpecker had a very strong signal there and a highly interfering signal. And uh, it would also, it was at a psychoactive frequency so that it would disrupt the, the appropriate uh, thinking capabilities of the brain. Uh, this is all documented, by the way, on the net. Oh yeah, it's all documented on the net. And uh, there were also, a good friend of mine was a man who discovered that they were bombarding the Moscow Embassy with microwaves mm -hmm. uh, that had the, much the same frequency content uh, and uh, so there was a uh, fellow that uh, designed a little device that you could wear under the collar which was provided to uh, 
uh, all of our personnel that we needed to make sure had clear thinking uh, that they could carry with them and it would send a signal, a close by signal, remembering that electromagnetic waves decrease with the cube of the distance. Uh, after a very short distance, uh, the signal is very, very weak. So you put a weak signal near the person and drive their mind into a, uh, a range that of brain waves that would be benign uh, or even hopefully beneficial. And they found a very simple way to uh, find out what was beneficial and then a very simple way to tune the device so that it would put those waves out. And they were carried by all types of diplomats and uh, military personnel. For so we years can assume the, the president and various people are, are, are using these devices to this I day. would certainly think they would be. I know, it would, I know that I uh, carry one around. Okay, and you're saying uh, this person who invented it, you're saying you're not, you're not the person who I invented it. I didn't say anything it. about it. Okay. Um, but it, you, there's also a technique involved such that one can do it without the device if one learns? Uh, yeah, you can learn to hold your mind pretty much in whatever mode you want. But it, it has to do with the informational field, is that right? No, it doesn't. It has to do with the electromagnetic field. Oh, really? Yep. So your, your mind ha you use your mind to affect the electromagnetic field? No. You just use, use your mind to generate its own electromagnetic field at a benign frequency. Or even a helpful to counter frequency. To counter it. Is to, what count, to counteract it. Well, you it, know, it, for, I'll give you an example. Uh, you get... You get three or four people that are very close, or two people that are even closer, and what you'll get is you'll get heartbeat synchronization, which just occurs, and then you'll get brainwave synchronization, and then unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the situation, you get uh, hormone production, and hormones are very, very powerful messengers and then you get into trouble, but uh, <laughs> or not. But uh, it's a form of entrainment, right? It's a form of entrainment, and you get an entrainment. So a very weak signal can give you great entrainment. Nikolai Tesla made a uh, a device that used compressed air, and it was a little weight, and he could stick that on the ground outside of a skyscraper in New York, and this thing would sense ground wave oscillations and tune itself to them. So it would start out very rapidly and slow down and then it would find where it was affecting the environment. It would resonate with it. It's like if you if you have a wine glass here and you play your violin upscale, eventually you'll find where if you stop real quick you'll hear the wine glass vibrating. Then if you play that note exactly, pretty soon the wine glass will break because just a little bit. It's like pushing a swing. If you push a swing in phase, the swing will go way high. If you push it out of phase, it'll stop. It won't go very high. It'll go high and then low. number of things. You want to get it resonant or in phase. So that's what Tesla's device would do. Was would move a weight up and down, up and down, up and down using pneumatic pressure and pneumatic valving. And he'd make the skyscrapers just wag like a dog's tail. So New York. I mean, isn't this the actual, like, sort of the kernel behind mind control? Is getting a, a very slow resonance uh, no. set up and then affecting it no. one way or another? No? no. No. Doesn't have much to do with mind control. But part of, of what you want to do, perhaps, with mind control is get your mind in a certain frequency. But that's old style mind control. And what you want to do now. Uh, basically, if you want to look at neurolinguistic programming, uses the principles of neurolinguistic programming is much more powerful than getting a brainwave entrainment. Brainwave entrainment will drop the IQ, it'll drop the attention span, uh, it'll drop the uh, change the memory. So there are a number of things that can be done there. But what we use now is a thing that changes the way the brain is attached to itself and the way the brain hooks together, and we just change the neural pathways. You can cause a person to forget. You can cause a per person to do things that they have no intention of doing. You can make a stimulus for that would cause one thing, 
like a stimulus that would cause me to reach out and grab some water and take a drink because I was thirsty, you can very quickly and easily change that stimulus to when I get thirsty, I'll reach out and grab a glass of water and pour it down my throat, or my neck, pour it down the front of my, my suit. So um, what about the idea that you were telling us about the piece of the heart, you could cut off a piece of the heart and it, and it would actually give it to uh, somebody who would recognize, a doctor, who would recognize it as a part of the brain or, or have resonance? It would, it would appear to be brain tissue. And, and this is a, like a medical fact, right? It's a medical fact. And there's a very good book that anyone who has a child that doesn't read this book should be jailed. <laughs> I'm serious. It's called The Magical Child by Joseph Chilton Pierce, P-E-A-R-C-E. -E. And he has follow-up books on it. For example, The Magical Child Matures tells you why that no uh, center city fatherless child is ever going to amount to anything, ever. They can't because their brain doesn't form properly. Really? Yep. A fatherless child. Well, um, or motherless. An a child that's raised outside of a normal family environment, let's put it that way. That's much more accurate. And it'll tell you why that can't happen, why they can't, they can't really become useful to society. Well, is this the, the thing you were telling us about the heart, being close it's to the heart? It's part of it. That's part of it. Of that's just part of it. There are a number of different factors. But one of the things that Pierce writes about in The Magical Child is, for example, that during the first uh, 16 days or so after the amniotic fluid breaks, the child is exposed to the electromagnetic field from the mother's heart beating and that field is modulated by what's in the brain cells in the heart, which are the emotions, and those emotions are transferred to the child. So they thought, well, that may be true, so they went to Europe where a lot of uh, women uh, have their children uh, um, raised. They have raised by wet nurses who nurse them on their breast. Uh, and they find out that the child takes on the emotional content of the wet nurse. Or children who are raised without a father never get the emotional, the male emotions from the father but as compared to the female emotions. It happens in the first 16 days first, after that. It's not the so greater hard. part of it happens in the first 16 to 18 days. Incredible. And it turns out, for example, uh, the Russians were, uh, did brilliant and massive research on this found out that if the child is born underwater in a fluid remember the child's already in a fluid it isn't going to hurt him to be underwater for a while the child's born underwater in a fluid about body temperature and moved up the, with contact with the mother to the breast where if you look at how you would naturally hold your arms and nurture a child the, the heart of the mother and the heart of the child are going to be right next to each other. The child starts picking things up. If the child is kept in that position for the first well, 12 to 14 hours, the child usually develops speech by uh, six months of age and uh, is able to stand uh, on their own at six months of age. Can you talk about that Russian doctor? I, I unfortunately uh, I could if I re remember his name. I can't remember his name. Okay. He was brought to the United States and uh, I can tell you that his techniques were used by Madonna in having her children. Hmm. But we're talking about generating an IQ of as high as 275. In right. Children. I can tell you that her children are some of the most brilliant children on the face of the earth because of that. I know that she worked for using those techniques for a year to a year and a half before they were conceived just to become ready. And uh, that could well be privileged information, but it leaked out to me. So you're and saying that, to be true. that the heart is, has an information field component which somehow entrains the formation no, of the No, I'm not saying anything about information field. I'm saying the okay. heart has an electromagnetic component that is, is there because the heart beats and it takes a large electrical current to beat the heart. Okay. Anything that's, the body is bioelectric. Anything near a magnetic field or an electric field that's conductive then has components that come from the things around it that are electric or magnetic or conductive. Okay. 
So you can see that stuff in the in the heart field. The information, not information field, the information transfers to the just like programming a ROM chip transfers to the uh, heart of the child and as an example uh, one of the final uh, proofs of this is uh, there was a, a man who absolutely hated the odor, the sight, and the taste of mustard and got a heart transplant and all of a sudden couldn't get enough mustard and just by happenstance the, the, the uh, wife of the donor uh, somehow got word to him that her husband loved mustard and so he had the heart that that came along with it number of people were uh, in essence SOBs or were very tense individuals and they got a heart from a man who was a very calm man and all of a sudden their wife and their children didn't even know who they were they were a completely different person that information was encoded in there and when the when the nerves were uh, sewn together and some of them grew back, uh, that information got out of the heart, and it may well be that the magnetic field of the heart transmitted and the brain picked it up. I, I you know I don't know that, but I know that we we instrumented uh, people's hearts and and. Uh, would let them see things that would excite them. The heart rate picks up, adrenaline's produced, uh, maybe maybe what they see, anger, causes anger or fear. And if you uh, anesthetize that part of the heart, then they have no, uh, they don't have those fears and those angers and so forth. So the, that emotional information and some things like preferences in flavor or color uh, you know, or, or transferred and transmitted in there. So it's very important to get the child up into a nurturing position. Children who were nurtured by both mother and father have both male and female components. Children nurtured by one or the other have only the one component of their emotional makeup. And it's the first 16 days that does it? Well, it, it's, it, it, read the book. The, it, the greater part of it occurs in the first 16 to 18 days. And yes, maybe maybe that's 30%. Maybe another 10% occurs in the next 50 days. Maybe another 10% in the next 180 days. Okay, but very early on. It's very early on. You want to get system. that in there very early on. Okay, well, I want to go in another direction. Is, is there any other tissue in the body besides the heart that acts like neurological tissue? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you can, if you want, you can call, uh, you know, the pineal part of the brain, even though it doesn't do brain function, uh -huh. it's part of the brain. The pineal is mo and pituitary uh, are uh, mostly melanin, uh, a substance called melanin. Melanin, a type of melanin makes the skin pigment but they're a different, slightly different kind of melanin and I've in my research have found that the melanin in the pineal which in uh, Eastern medicine is the third eye, the, the seat of the third eye uh, is very 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 good at picking up informational signals and adding a time content to them thus subtracting a non-time content and so it, it is, uh, it's always been attributed uh, to uh, uh, clairvoyance and clairaudience and so forth. Those are signals that are, are taken out of a signal that appears to be everywhere, every when. It coheres that for the person and they have certain abilities that they wouldn't have. The, the Tibetans drill a hole in the front of the forehead with a little rock drill and then they poke a bamboo skewer in and manipulate the uh, pineal to quote unquote open the third eye and what it does is it gives it a, a, a hole through the Faraday cage speaking in science terms and it, it makes a sensitivity by making a piece of scar tissue that opens up or opens the third eye or opens 
clairvoyance or clairaudience or remote viewing or remote influencing or a number of different things. Isn't it true that fluoride uh, deadens or hardens the, the pineal gland? Absolutely. And isn't and, and what since it mostly we have fluoride hardens, in our water, is, well, isn't there a sort of a, basically you could look at that as an Illuminati plot to to uh, to uh, deaden the, the intelligence and the psychic ability of what, the what I try to do as a scientist to state the scientific things, I don't presume about what the Illuminati want to do. Okay. But I can tell you that the main thing that halides, which are chlorine, fluorine, bromine, mainly what they do in the body is congeal uh, cholesterol into arterial plaque. So I mean that's slows, well known. Slows down the the artery. I have the it, no, it, yes, it'll do. Yeah, it closes down the arteries. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are many ways to sterilize water, other than chlorine and fluorine. There are many ways. Uh, for example, uh, we say, well, we use chlorine for tooth decay. You have a whole fleet of boats up and down the west coast of the United States and the east coast of the United States that can't fish anymore because we've killed all the fish, except there are bottom feeders called, uh, I won't tell you the name of the fish, but there are bottom feeders that is a fish that consists of 60% of the weight of the fish is liver, and about 60% of the liver is, is that particular fish liver oil which contains a compound called Activator X by Price of the Price Pottinger Foundation of years ago fame. And he found out right after World War II that one drop of that, well, you can take that fish oil, which is highly uh, fishy tasting, uh, get it cold, the waxes and false isomers will solidify, you can filter those out, and the oil left over uh, is... Uh, has very little of, or no taste to it and that oil uh, you can put in the sunlight and it won't turn rancid for hundreds of years. It should have been used in place of whale, sperm whale oil for, uh, for lubricating watches but they didn't use it for that. And, so is uh, it this cod liver oil? No, it's not cod liver oil. It's a different oil but the, those, those Boats could go out and bring back boatloads of this fish. It grows from Antarctica to Arctica and everywhere in between. All right, what does that have to do with fluoride in the water? What it has to do with is that that oil, one drop put in a slice of bread eaten daily, and you have no caries whatsoever. There's no tooth decay. It eliminates tooth decay. So, and, and they did this on thousands and hundreds of thousands of children in Europe after World War II. And likewise, it doesn't. You can guard against hardening of the arteries. And you, well, uh, then you don't get the hardening of the arteries from the fluoride or the chloride. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened was, and this is this is, you know, I'll take. Uh, uh, um, I'll take the hit for this, let's put it that way. Uh, it's my conjecture that the only reason we use chloride in the water was because the politicians have already spent all of the Social Security money. So you've got to have something there so that people die at retirement age. <laughs> then because of health care yes. getting better, we had to have something else that made it happen even faster, so we put fluoride in the water. Wow. Because they could have so gotten rid of tooth decay with an absolutely benign substance that we had a whole industry here that could go out and bring us back all we could ever use for the whole world very inexpensively and totally uh, uh, non-negatively in the body. But we didn't do that. Now, it's, a, it's the reason that that, that fish oil doesn't, tank, uh, doesn't uh, turn rancid is obviously because it's an antioxidant. It's the best antioxidant known to man, as far as I know. Price called it Activator X. It has a definite chemical formula. It could definitely be put out there. But it would eliminate most of heart surgery. It would eliminate tooth decay. So it's not put out there, because that isn't efficient in our system, in our capitalistic system. When well, you said you're price. worldwide, though, as well, right? Yeah, it would be worldwide. I mean, like I say, we did it in Europe after World War II for, for years. What but we said? took that activator X, by the way, was taken, taken, there's a small amount of it in wheat germ oil. Hmm. So that was taken from wheat germ oil. Now we found the rat, uh, I found uh, the ratfish had this stuff in 
you know, massive amounts. When you said price, do you mean Dr. Weston price? Weston price, yeah. Okay. And uh, so, uh, it's my conjecture. There only, I mean, the only reason I could see that we would be using that is to is to kill people off. Why else would you do that? Saying about the pineal gland. Because I have a whole long section in my video that everybody's seen, most of this audience right. has seen it, uh, all about the pineal gland. So okay. you're saying that this oil, if taken, would help to decalcify the pineal gland or somehow increase its sensitivity? If, if the pineal gland is calcified by halides, yes it would. Okay. But you're not naming the fish other than the... I wasn't really naming the, the fish. The rat fish that you just talked no. about. No. And that's not the... Not the main source. No, that's what it's called in certain areas of the world. Hmm. Okay, um, well, okay, but I was curious, you, you said something about, um, you know, there's camps being built around the United States, do you know the purpose behind them? Uh, yes, there are camps to detain people. And is this going to, is this something that goes on the tail end, because I'm looking for the agenda that goes behind the, you know, the crash of the dollar that basically you're saying is coming at some point in the near future. Quite possibly, right? That's what I your think that's a great possibility. I'm okay. planning for it. Okay. And then on top of it, there are camps being built, and you can verify that? Well, uh, they're giving tours of some of them, and uh, you go on the internet, and you'll find out that there are a number of locations where people say, well, here's a camp that's built. Okay, and, and, and what about the role of viruses in eliminating the po population? Is there any? Validity to that. I have no idea. It's not my area of expertise. Okay. I have suppositions, and uh, well, uh, you clearly are a healer. Um, so, have you got advice on how people can protect themselves for from uh, viruses? Well, uh, I think all that advice is available if you just download it from the uh, FDA websites or the uh, uh, various websites of say FEMA and. Homeland Security. Really? Oh, absolutely. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. They're absolutely correct. Okay. Uh, another good thing to do is be go with, go to some place there's not a lot of people. And we're sitting here filming in an area that there's a, not a lot of people. The town says entering the town on one side of the sign, and on the same other side of the sign post it says entering the town, and First Street's in some great big city somewhere else because. <laughs> There's not another street. <laughs> okay, well, um, so what what is it that you think is coming in the future in terms of, let's talk about outer space a little bit. Do you think that there's anything out there that we need to be aware of? Well, uh, I think there's all kinds of things out there we need to be aware of. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's the only threat, in other words, is the well, only Well, it's a major our, uh, threat that we, right now, don't have any deterrent for. What threat? A, a threat from outside the, outside the, you know, the planetary bounds. Well, what about the satellites that have recently been classified such that they won't tell us about incoming bodies? That's all classified suddenly. Well, uh, that I don't know about. I didn't realize that had been done, but if it's been done, it's obviously been done for some reason, and that reason may be to stop panic. I know the government has a, a tremendous belief in whatever you do, don't cause panic in the people. Because when you cause panic in the people, then it draws attention to the lawmakers, the Senate, the Congress, and the presidency, and the ruling party, and they, they're not looking. You know, it's, it's like the old Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. You know, try to live in times that have no, they're not at all interesting, they're boring as hell, nothing's going to happen. So, uh, uh, I, I think that anything that might happen that would cause people to start thinking about, well, why isn't something being done here? We're out of money. We've been out of money for years. And okay. so we don't have money to go do anything about it. So, why let the people worry? Okay, but you were telling me something about the fact that you think there's really only 10 months left for the sort of the rollout of what could could be like reversing the agenda. I mean, I don't, I don't even know if you believe it's possible to reverse the agenda that's being rolled I, out at the moment. Well, but, I but know that we left about ten months because that the Earth we've polluted our own. Mess. Okay, here's a 
here, here are just a few things that you can look up and the things I talk about are things that are openly available on the Internet. Library of Congress or uh, you know a lot of things now on YouTube, a lot of things on uh, you know ask.com and uh, google.com and so forth. You can go in there and start making searches and looking and you can find a lot of information. There's a tremendous amount of information. Uh, about? Uh, about the things that you uh, just spoke about and then and specifically uh, you can find out that oh it's about a couple of weeks ago we just uh, had a very near flyby of a huge asteroid that would have caused thousands if not millions depending on where it hit thousands or millions of deaths on the earth if it had hit the earth and it was a near flyby now maybe that nearness was a hundred thousand miles but a hundred thousand miles is sure different than the distance between here and and Mars or here in Pluto, it's it's came by very close. It it could have been one of those things that hit the Earth, and we have nothing to stop something like that. Okay, uh, you're saying we have nothing to stop something. Is it possible black people in black projects have something to stop that? No, I don't believe so. Okay, and what about if they did? Uh, I don't believe they've had the money to build it. And what about positive aliens? Do you think that they might interfere with something? Well, of that if there are such things as positive aliens, I think that. Uh, you know, I, I, I wonder, I look at Earth and I look at the things we've done to destroy this fragile little spaceship that we live on going through, going through the space. And we've destroyed, you know, we talk about burning, we talk badly about all the burning of the rainforests in Brazil. And yet most of the oxygen is produced by plankton in our use of nickel cadmium batteries and lead batteries and putting them out into the environment has killed a good part of the plankton. Cetaceans are beaching themselves to make so that there's enough food left for the others. Because they're that wise. Well, I, I think that they are, and of course you had to have worked with them and some of the military programs to understand how wise they are. Okay, well, um, I'm going to have to wind this up. I would love to talk to you all night and all day, and um, especially if you were able to come out with, with some of the more th fascinating things that you're involved in. But um, Project Camelot wants to thank you um, very much. I want to thank you for your service to humanity. You've clearly been involved in some things that are healing for the, the, the population out there. You, you're here trying to testify to something coming that you firmly believe that people need to be aware of. And so I want to thank you. I appreciate your interest. Uh, anything that can get information out to the people and my suggestion to the people is because this stuff is not really hidden it may be squirreled away somewhere but it's there and you can go out and find the information for yourself my suggestion is you do it my suggestion is that you prepare yourself for an emergency because no matter what you do in life you're going to run into an emergency and if you prepare yourself for it then uh, you stand a very good chance of uh, surviving it, and if you don't prepare yourself for it, you stand a very good chance of not surviving it. Okay, thank you. And uh, Pete Peterson, I really, I really want to thank you again. Um, Bill, you want to want to say any closing words yourself? I think this is the most important interview we've ever done. Okay, and uh, David, you got anything you want to add to that? Well, Pete, I just want to say I appreciate your courage for uh, inviting us out here. I think that the data that you've given about the consciousness and the information field is, is really instrumental in my work and I hope we can continue that discussion. Well I think that we'll probably continue a relationship for a long time and I'm perfectly willing to share that information. I'm at a point in my life that uh, uh, the only thing I can do now to make my life worthwhile is to share the wisdom that I've obtained as a stone rolling through this interesting uh, experience of life on Earth. Been involved with trying to build uh, flying saucers. You usually found that flying saucers, if you look at most of the movies, there always seems to be a robot involved with it.